In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the new HTML5 form input attributes. So let's start off with our form, our action, which we'll leave blank, and our method, we'll be using get, our field set, and our legend. Right. So let's just start off with a simple text input. Give this a name of username. Right, so what happens when we want the user to load up the page and have their cursor already flashing in a specified input? So that's actually quite handy when someone loads the page and focus is already being brought to that input on page load. So they can just start typing as soon as the page is loaded. We can do that with the autofocus attribute. And in HTML5, it looks just like that. So let's load this in the browser by saving it and previewing it. And as you can see on page load, my cursor is already flashing in this input and I could already start typing. So that's quite a handy feature. So what if we actually require a user to actually fill in a certain input? We can do that by using the required attribute just like that. So let's go ahead and add in our input of type submit so we can test out this required attribute. We can go ahead and save this and take a look in the browser. As you can see, our input field still has the autofocus attribute working nicely. So if I go ahead and click submit, I actually get this little pop-up saying, please fill out this field. So I can go ahead and type in anything and the form will be submitted. So let's now take a look at the checked attribute. We can use this with either radio buttons or checkboxes. So let's try out some radio buttons first. Input type equals radio. Give this a name of on off and give it a value of on. And another radio button. Input type equals radio. Name equals on off and value equals off and add in some checkboxes input type equals checkbox name equals checkbox one and the value is yes we'll say and one more checkbox type equals checkbox Give this a name of checkbox2 and a value of say no. So now we have some radio buttons and checkboxes. I'm actually going to go ahead and add in some labels so we can actually see which form input types are which. And add in an ID always to match the labels for attribute and again an ID to match the labels for attribute just a few more labels And for our checkboxes, and ID to match the labels for attribute, and one last label. So now we can go ahead and specify the checked attribute. 
So I'm going to set this off radio button to checked. And also, let's set both of these checkboxes to checked. So let's save this and take a look at what the checked attribute does for radio buttons and checkboxes. As you can see, both checkboxes are checked by default, and the off radio button is also checked by default, as specified in the file, in the HTML file. So if you're not familiar with the input type of email and how it actually works in the browser, let's go ahead and create this email input type. Input type equals email. We'll give it a name of email and close it just like that. Also add in a label so we can actually see that this is for the email input. And an ID to match the labels for attribute as always. Go ahead and save this and check it out in the browser. So like I was saying, if you are not familiar with the email input type, it is kind of asking for a valid email address, but I could type in something like this, Ashley at example, which is a completely invalid email address, and it will still be submitted. I'll show you what I mean. I'll just enter in some text here as this field is required. So as you can see, I'm able to submit a completely invalid email address. So it's not very helpful. So let's go ahead and change this. One option to change this is actually use an input type of text and using a pattern attribute. The reason for changing the input type to text is that Google's Chrome supports both the pattern attribute and the input type of email. So there'll be a little bit of conflict if we tried to use both. So let's take a look at the pattern attribute and how that works. Basically, we have some opening and closing square brackets, and in there we can pass in the type of letters or numbers that we will allow. So in here I'm going to type in a lowercase a hyphen lowercase z, uppercase a hyphen uppercase z. That's essentially saying we will allow lowercase and uppercase letters. Then what we do inside some curly braces is we can specify the minimum and maximum values or one single static value. So let's say we want a minimum of three and we're not going to specify a maximum, we're just going to have a minimum. So this could be any length that the user enters as long as it's longer than three. And then we want an at symbol, then we want to open our square brackets again and type in A hyphen Z, capital A hyphen capital Z. And then what we want is a minimum of three of them. And then we want a dot. So we'll put the dot inside the square brackets. And then again, we will pass in the amount that we will allow. And here we'll pass in a static value, i.e. just one singular value. And this will be one. We only want one full stop there. Then we open and close our square brackets again and pass in A to Z, capital A to capital Z, and then the number that we will allow. We'll allow a minimum of two with no maximum specified, as there are some domain names like .me that have only two letters and you know we don't want to cause any problem for those users. So let's go ahead and save this and check out this pattern attribute. So let's just enter in some data. And for the email address, I'm now going to select an invalid email address and see how this works. And as you can see, we have this please match the requested format pop-up show up on the browser and our form has not been submitted. So what happens if I put the .com? This is now a valid email address. Clicking submit, 
that now submits the form. So as you can see, when I type in an invalid email address and click submit, this pop-up isn't very helpful. The end user will most likely never know what the requested format is. So we can help the user out by passing in a title attribute. This looks just like this. There are other cases where you use a title attribute, for example in hyperlinks, and when the user hovers over a hyperlink, if you have the title attribute specified, the text inside the title attribute will actually show up in a little yellow balloon, and it may explain to the user why they should click on a link and kind of where the link will go. A little bit of extra information is always helpful to the end user. So for the title, I'm just going to type in, please enter in a valid email address. And we could also give an example, say example at example.com. Let's save this and see what happens when I type in an invalid email address this time. Let's enter in some data as this field is being required. So let's enter in Ashley at example and see what happens when I click submit. Please match the requested format. Please enter in a valid email address. Example at example.com. So that's very helpful to the user and it lets them know what they've done wrong and why the form hasn't actually been submitted or gone through. So let's take a look at using the pattern attribute with the tell input type. So input type equals tell. Name, I'm just going to call this phone. And close it just like that. And we'll add in our label. Just going to call it phone. and an ID of phone to match the labels for attribute. Right, so let's add in the pattern attribute. We do this just as we did before. So pattern equals opening closing quotes. So to allow numbers, we can simply do this. Open and close our square brackets and put in a zero hyphen nine. That'll accept any number in between 0 and 9. So pretty much all numbers. Then we pass in the amount of that type of input that we will allow. And let's say we want four of them, followed by a space. And then we want some more numbers. We actually want three of them, a space, and then some more numbers. And we want three of them. So let's go ahead and also add in our title attribute. Please enter in a number in this format. So something like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. Let's save this and check it out in the browser. So let's just get out information entered in correctly and for the phone number if I just type in a random bunch of numbers with no spaces and not adhering to our pattern clicking submit we get this pop-up saying please match the requested format please enter in a number in this format so that's actually quite helpful so let's try it out with the correct format clicking submit and the form has been submitted So that's how we can use the pattern attribute in HTML to kind of provide some form of guidance and disallow some form of input. But you should never rely solely on client-side technologies to validate any form of user input. And I'll give you a great example of this right now. So if I right-click on this username field, clicking inspect element, we can see our HTML inside the Elements panel. And here we can see Autofocus and the required attribute. I can go ahead and just simply double click on the required attribute, press Delete and Enter, and that field is no longer required. So I can click Submit now and the form will go through. 
and the same with our email. I can go in and change the allowed pattern, or I could simply go in and change the entire pattern by deleting it, just like that. And I'll delete the required attribute again. And as you can see, the end user can actually manipulate the form. So it's never a good idea to rely solely on client-side technologies to validate any form of user input. So I hope you've learned a little bit about using the pattern attribute, autofocus, the required attribute, and checked for radio buttons and checkboxes, and also the title attribute.